Greetings and salutations. I'm going to do another video follow up of what I put out there last night on um, on the misspelled mage. So this will be episode two. Uh, again, the topics in this series are very opinionated. So, you know, may, may not be factual, but they are just the way that I see things. So uh, the second episode, uh, I'm going to be talking about tension. Something I wanted to bring up last night uh, and forgot to. So I'm bringing that back into the discussion and it's a subject I feel like can be dedicated to its own video anyway and the when I'm talking about tension we are talking about now I w I'm using these terms because of the lack of better terms so when I s mention these terms you need to look past them and get what I'm talking about I'm making a comparison and that is things like plot and story and so on and so forth and one of the biggest uh, contributors to what is a good story is the tension and the release of said tension. And in my opinion, uh, modern game systems, including 5th edition, and I'm sure with the upcoming whatever in the world they're calling this thing coming up, there's a lack of tension. In fact, tension has not really been, um, been a concern with the games uh, for quite some time. In fact, I would say probably third edition was probably the last time there was any real tension. And we're being very generous there because third edition also in introduced a lot of mechanics that made it kind of hard to kill player characters. But <clears throat> all in all, continuing on. Um, and why do I say that? Well, it's because there there's no real inherent risk in a lot of the adventures that you see uh, being put out for these modern systems or really any of the even the homebrewed stuff there doesn't seem to be any tension and i mean one of the points i want to make is the is the dark souls rpg that came out a couple years ago um for those of you that don't know you know my my channel used to be a dark souls streaming channel for the video game and you know they of course jumped on the bandwagon to make a to make an rpg a tabletop role playing game for it and um, it flopped. Uh, well, not necessarily flopped, but it didn't exactly make bank either. Uh, a lot of reviews say it was disappointing. And in my opinion, it was because they used the 5th edition engine for it. And for a game like Dark Souls, whose tagline is prepared to die, the 5th edition engine was probably very high on the list of engines to avoid for that kind of gameplay and to... Uh, bring about that particular aesthetic to the game, right? So, and I say that because in 5th edition, and I say this as somebody who started with 5th edition, it's very hard to kill a character. Um, my current character, my first ever character is still alive. And I have a second one for another buddy's uh, campaign that he he did a short campaign with. Um I played that character as stupidly as possible, and even then, because, you know, I was just, like, trying to get used to the mechanics, you know, and I mean, I, because he was a character that, that had average stats and everything, so he literally could be any class he wanted to, so I just started building this guy as, uh, taking a level in every class, um, just because I could, just because I thought it was funny, and even he didn't have a hard time at all. Um, r really what it comes down to is because there's not this much risk involved when it comes to misadventures or really any kind of sense of failure and that there's all these fail safes in, in place in these newer editions to prevent uh, a total party kill or to prevent a, uh, a failure that's so stupendously high risk that it leads to a character's death because of that there's no tension. And so the, they have to rely on a railroady linear adventure with a script in order to make it somewhat interesting. This is why I say like one of the, like the only interesting thing in my opinion about fifth edition is is the horror stories you read about on on Reddit, you know, and again, most of those are fake. That should tell you something because I had to make something up to to give the game any kind of in, interest. You know, uh, people watch Critical Role, but, I mean, Critical Role didn't start with 5th edition, they started with Pathfinder 1st edition, right, and, 
you know, people like it, it's all about the tourism of the hobby. And don't get me wrong, that that in my opinion is that in my opinion is, is not a bad thing. But that's a subject for another day. But because of the the friendliness of it, the the lack of danger, the fact that it's not dangerous, uh, really waters down and homogenizes the game system in a lot of ways. Whereas you go to old school games or rule sets, the risk is so high that um, player character death is almost the norm. Um, normally through misadventure, you might have a bad role, but most of the time it's because people learn the hard way that murder hoboing is not a legitimate way to play these games. At least not for very long. Eventually it will get you killed in the game world. Uh, so it's one of the reasons why I try to avoid calling these systems fatal or deadly. More like they highly discourage mur murder hobo play. But because of the intrinsic nature of having 3d6 down the line and rolling for hit points at level 1, although you can have a lot of people house rule full, full possible HP at level 1, but you know if you go with rolling at level 1, um, and even if you take that house rule, it's still a very high probability that your character is not going to see level 2. There is a difference between an OSR character and a modern character because the modern character can logically assume that they are going to reach 5th level at level 1. Pardon me. And so they plan ahead and make a build because they have that luxury they they're they're fine there's no and because they're fine with that there's no tension to it and thus the stories are horrible there is no emergent storytelling there is no story really worth telling because there's very little risk involved they're all going to make it out okay maybe one or two of them won't make it but even then it, it death is so unheard of that i find it humorous that my exposure to the game before I was actually a player and before I actually was in the hobby and I'd watch all these YouTube videos of people talking about it and they all talked about player character death and like oh my goodness I, I, I hope I don't die and this that and everything else and then I, I get into it and then like I discover that these people were talking about 5th edition and 5th edition is probably the least likely that you're going to have a TPK and I thought it was humorous that they even talk about it because it's such a rare instance of any of that ever happening at those kind of tables that they're not even a concern at all it's this false tension that they have to create whereas in an osr table in an osr game that threat is very much real 3d6 down the line you're not guaranteed to have any good stats at all you're not guaranteed to have an xp bonus you're not guaranteed anything you're not guaranteed to have um a, a good enough lock picking skill if you're using the thief table or even if you have these at all in your campaign you you're not guaranteed to even be able to carry more than like 70 pounds in some cases not even 60 pounds of weight so again depending on rule systems but that's just the way it is and so because of that because of the fragile nature of player characters the tension is very much real because the first foray into the dungeon could be that character's very last. And in all honesty, that's what brings about better storytelling. After all, I could tell you of all the times where a player character death was actually, in my opinion, cooler. Like, made a better story, especially early on, than somebody's railroady, we're going to go fight the gods kind of story. I hate those kind of stories. They're They're terrible. And they usually come about from somebody pre-planning and pre-scripting everything out. And so player agency goes out the window. There is no actual autonomy to these characters. It's a false autonomy. It's a cardboard cutout. That's all it is. <coughs> After all, what, what does the choice matter when your only cho choices are left and right? You know? But, you know, because I, I think back of my experiences... The better stories that, that I can tell today came about from more interesting gameplay. Uh, more interesting, higher stakes gameplay. After all, I have a party that had a Session 1, very first encounter, TPK, by wolves in the old island fortress of Morgan's Fort. They went in, the thief tried to 
sneaky sneak his way in, see what he could see. Unfortunately, he wasn't as quiet as he thought and snapped on a twig and the wolves woke up and everybody started going. Then when they made new characters, they, of course, wanted to go back into the Old Island Fortress. But, you know, th there was an in-game explanation why they would go into the Old Island Fortress. So they go back in, they see these corpses. They're going to loot these corpses, these poor little souls that got mauled to death by wild dogs. And then here comes a Kakilia right up. And it's like, ah, we're not going that way. And that was a random encounter. That was not even, that was just a die, a die roll that decided, uh, yeah, you're not going that way. And so what did they do? They went outside. They started making these, uh, these kind of, um, the, the, these barriers made out of spikes that they, they whittled out from, from trees, from pine trees, you know, and they like hammered together. I can't remember what they're called, but they're like these barrier kind of things that look like punji spikes, right? So they put them up and they brought them back and, and they would construct them in the dungeon. And they, because the dungeon's first room is this octagon shape that basically, North takes you back to the stairs outside. West is where they died and found the Kakilia. They haven't been east or south yet. So they decide, they would choose a direction and then they'd set those punji spikes up on the backside. And a couple times those punji spikes would actually catch something and kill it. Uh, or it'd be dying by the time they got back. That made for interesting gameplay. Something that wasn't there before, there it is now. It made the world feel more real. Then there was a time where a dwarf, they, they were... <clears throat> this is a different party. Uh, this was at a home table not over Discord. And they're going down this river, right? And they're going to try to make their way to this one dungeon that they heard about uh, with all this stuff. And they go through the dungeon. They kill quite a few monsters and get a pretty good haul. And they decide they're going to go back to town. So they're going to go back up the river in this rowboat. Unfortunately, somebody was a little too overweight. And while everybody else was able to make their save, to where they kept the boat upright and they didn't fall out. This guy swooshed right into the water he went. And because he's wearing plate mail, he wasn't going to be able to swim. And they tried their best to save him, but unfortunately, like a rock, brrr, done. And that was a level one adventure. And I'm reminded of another level one adventure. Where the player characters go down into this dungeon that is the Tomb of the Dying God. And they're going to try to fight this. And they were these guys were actually at level 3. Now I think about it. This was very dangerous. This was something I created that I put over the side. And I kept over here because I was like, maybe one day they'll run into this. And then they'll get the message that this might be too dangerous for them. And then they'll leave and come back later. Nope. They wanted it. So they go down into this dungeon. And this dungeon is full of nasty things like gibbering mouthers and stuff like that. And shugoths and all that. You know, this is a very uh, Lovecraftian kind of place. And they run into um, into an illithid, you know, and, uh, you know, they fight the illithid and all that. And then they're trying to make their way out, and they run into a Shugoth. And on the way out, the it wasn't actually a player character this time. This was a, a retainer. This was a hireling, an NPC that they had hired that was hired to fight. And that Shugoth um, got a good little meal. So it brings about much more interesting play because the the because they get back to town they think that could easily have been us, and then you, they had to sit there and think what in the world did we just encounter? We've never seen anything like that before. We probably never see anything like that ever again. What in the world was that? How do we live with this, knowing that something like that exists beneath the Earth's surface? That brings about another question: these extremely dangerous things. What do they think of if they? sit there and ponder and say, what would, we do, what would we do if this made it to the surface world? How would how would any of the civilized races be able to fight this? There's like this demon thing living underneath the dwarves' kingdom. What are they going to do if that thing decides to come right out of the ground one day? Just like the Balrog at Khazad Doom. Like, what are they going to do? Nothing? <laughs> it's going to kill all the dwarves. What, what are the elves going to do when when the murder tree decides to sprout? This this tree that was worshipped by these evil druids and like somebody burnt the tree down but now the, the acorn has been planted in the ground and it's being fed with the blood of kidnapped and sacrificed victims and it's starting to sprout and it's growing at a very alarming rate and it's corrupting the forest that the elves live in. What are they going to do about that? How are they going to be able to do that? Because this thing is starting to become sentient and it's starting to attack things or control other sentient individuals. 
and try to turn them into a hive mind. Kind of like um, that weird uh, mold thing. I can't remember the name of it. it. It's like this mold thing that controls insects and stuff like that. It's like these spores or whatever. Uh, these fun funguses that do that. But, you know, it's kind of doing that little thing. And it's corrupting everybody and making them kill each other. What are the hobbits going to do whenever the stinking uh, hills are set ablaze by, like, this, other, this, like, monstrous dragon that has finally grown to an age where he can actually really terrorize the countryside. And the, and the nearest human settlement with all the really good weaponry is at least three, four days march away. What are they going to do about that? It's a very high risk thing. What what is humanity going to do whenever if somebody decides that they're going to take over an entire race and all the other races and dominate them in a way to where now they're going to single out humanity because humanity is not as long lived. What are they going to do about that? Very high risk. But I mentioned a bunch of things about that was world ending. That never happened in my games. It was the implications. The implications that happened at a very real moment in time at the table. An encounter with something that was very high risk. What are they going to do if that thing ever breaks through the surface world? And if it reproduces and there's more of it? Because that was a very deadly encounter. Or like the bad luck stuff like falling out of the boat. Or being mauled by wolves. Wolves are a very real thing. That's why people can relate to it. But... I've rambled on. You've listened to me ramble on long enough. I thank you for your patience. So, as always, guys, take care. God bless, and I'll see you on the other side.